Hello, WonderCon at home. My name is Daniel Pickett of Action Figure Insider. And uh, thank you very much for allowing us to be here part of WonderCon at Home 2021. Uh, I've been doing some panels for both uh, Comic-Con and WonderCon for about 20 years now and always do things about the toy industry just because that's, that's what I'm interested in. That's why I started Action Figure Insider. I always love knowing how the sausage gets made. I love the stories behind all the toys that I love. And in doing this for so long, one of the questions that comes up a lot after the fact when we do uh, these Q&As at the end is where are the women? Uh, because a lot of times it's, it's still toys are, are kind of a boys club. And I've done this panel once before. I did it at Comic-Con once before with a variety of women in the industry. And I thought it'd be fun to, to revisit again now for WonderCon. And uh, my thinking in putting this panel together is I wanted really kind of a uh, uh, a diverse look at different uh, careers in in the uh, toy field, and and these ladies can talk about a little bit what they do, and what they you know different jobs they have had in it in the past. And uh, we're just going to have a, a good time, a good conversation, and we're going to have some fun. I hope you learn a little something. Uh, I'm sorry we can't be there in person. We are sick of being in our homes too. We would much rather be at a convention mingling buying stuff, smelling stinky people, and just, you know, all the, all the con stuff that we have missed for a year. Uh, my last convention was Toy Fair of, uh, of last year, and, uh, you know, I got to see a, a couple of you, but, uh, you know, we, we haven't had anything, and, and we're still in it for a while, so um, we're going to make do the best we can and just have a fun conversation, and again, thank you ladies for being here. So we're going to start off just we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, let's first have you introduce yourself. Uh, you can talk about where you're at now, if you've worked for a previous toy company, and what your role is. And then we'll kind of go back around and we'll talk about uh, how you came into the toy industry. So let's start uh, with Abby, since we'll be alphabetically. And so Ashley, you're on deck. <laughs> All right, I'm Abby Pickett, and I work at Mattel, and I have been there for four years now. Um, I am a licensing associate in the product development side of the business, and I primarily work uh, on the vehicles end of it. Ashley? Yeah, I'm Ashley Powell. I am the senior director of product development. Uh, I work for Loot Crate, but I also work across the other sister companies. So NECA, uh, Ruby's, uh, Kid Robot, I kind of dabble and help out with product development strategy um, and resources and solutions across the board, but primarily focusing on Loot Crate. Um, I've been there for a little over a year now. Um, we work on licenses across anime, you know, Warner Brothers Studios, um, gaming, you name it. it. We run the gamut. I can't even tell you how many IPs <laughs> that we touch upon. Uh, I previously was at General Giant Studios for about 14 years. Um, and before that, I was at DC Comics working for DC Direct. And before that, I was at Kid Robot. So I've kind of hopped around here a little bit. And full circle in some ways. Full circle, absolutely. It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hillary. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Hillary, and I work at Funko. Funko is my first toy job. Um, I've been there for five years, and I am the associate director of fan marketing. So I came in, um, really started with photography video and went into social media and now I am running the fan marketing team, which is really fun. Um, although it's my first toy specific job before this, I did marketing for haunted houses. Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> How fun. <laughs> All right, Jen. Turn. Yeah. Hi, I am Jen Cassidy. Um, I am the Vice President of Business Development and Licensing at Super 7, and I have only been there for a few months because previously I was at McFarland Toys for 14 years um, in a multitude of positions between um, entertainment um, and comics. I was a comics editor there for about seven years, and then I segued into the toy side of the business um, for the last seven years of my run. 
All right. So let's talk a little bit kind of about secret origins and how you find yourself in the field of toys. I know, uh, you know, way back in the day when when people would find themselves, you know, especially like designers, they would, you know, they'd go to engineering school and they'd learn to engineer like cars and toothbrushes and stuff. And no one really chose toys. They just kind of fell into it. But we're in kind of this great golden age uh of pop culture and and we are the people that sort of grew up playing with this stuff and and now it's like a viable career that you can seek out so uh anyone want to start off kind of how you found yourself in these roles i will All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a nice segue from you know when you go to school so my background's industrial design and I never really did any toy design in college. It was all just, you know, cameras or vehicles um, and really process oriented, which I really loved. But I also realized I didn't want to sit behind a computer and be a computer jockey and doing models. I loved the process and finding solutions. And of course, when I graduated, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of jobs out there. Um, and, you know, I love toys and comics and pop culture, but it wasn't something I was actively looking for per se. Um, I grew up in Ohio and I took a leap of faith and moved to New York City and was working at a restaurant and I was scrounging, scrounging Craigslist every day looking for a job, anything that could help pay my rent. <laughs> and um, I found this little ad in there for this um, designer toy store that they were opening up in New York City and they were looking for someone to be an assistant manager and I thought they wanted someone with a design background. I was like, okay, that's me. Uh, it's retail. Okay, not super excited about that, but hey, let's check it out. So I obviously I interviewed and I, I got the job um, and it was to open the first uh, New York City Kid Robot store back in 2003. And so there at the time, the owner, he was, you know, buying stuff from Japan and they were one offs. And here we are down in this little basement in Soho in New York City. Um, opening up these boxes, you know, of Michael Lau toys and, and um, you know, Fafi Girl capsule toys and all these really cool things. And people just loved coming to the store. And there was this amazing energy and you had a graffiti artist and we would do art openings and we worked with David Horvath and we did the first ice bat gallery release and the first Dunnies before anyone was even doing designer toys. So it was like this really amazing time, you know, now that you look back 20 years and you're like, wow, this was kind of part of history. And during that time, people come in and out and have those conversations. And, you know, I think this kind of goes to where my advice is, is that you just never know who you're going to meet or who you're going to network with, even if it's not even in a place where you think you'd meet someone that might be your next, you know, career move. Um, and so I was talking to, you know, some guys that came into Kid Robot and they worked at DC Comics. And they said, hey, we're looking for a product designer. And I was like, hey, I, I need to keep on moving on up. So um, I met with them and I got hired to work at DC Direct. And so, you know, just by these, you know, little conversations and whatnot, I was able to really get my foot in the door um, and get in the toy biz, um, which I had no idea. I knew the basic Superman, Wonder Woman, but I didn't really have any the deep mythos of any character or anything. And so... For the next few years, I spent organizing prototype closets and working with artists and designers. And from there, it was just kind of networking and working my way to where I am today. So it's, you know, it's just a leap of faith, <laughs> I guess. All right, I love it. And then, and then you literally switched coasts at one point then, because like you said, DC's in New York and then General Giant is out on the West Coast, so. Yeah, so Toy Fair was a blizzard. Imagine that at Toy Fair. Um, <laughs> we were uh, hanging out with some folks from General Giant. We would we shared a showroom with them in the toy building, and other so, toy buildings. Uh, yeah, it was such you know so much fun setting up and all the little parties. Um, but I again, I was looking, sniffing around, seeing kind of opportunities. I'd only been to California once before, and I said, "Hey, are you guys hiring?" Because we'd hired them to do prototyping for us. Um, and so sure enough, a month later, it's, um, one of the, um, managers at the time, who's now at Mattel, um, he was like, Hey, we're hiring. I'm on a plane to go to China, but get your resume over. And then pretty much two months later, I was like, say la vie. And I was like, I'll just give it a year. <laughs> and I was at general giant for then for about almost 15 years. That's great. 
I know for me, I, I, I don't know that I ever, um, pitted that I wanted to be in toys. And I don't know if it's like this for the other women, but I always knew that I wanted to be around creative energy and art and, you know, what were those jobs that were going to put me in those positions, right? And so for me, my career, I think all of us kind of touch consumer products in some way, right? And so for me, I just took a leap of faith and, you know, like Ashley, I moved out to LA and just said, what kind of job can I get in this creative field that I don't know that I'm trying to find? Um, and so I ended up at Disney, but not in the consumer products group. I ended up in the character voices group. And what the character voices group is that we worked with the consumer products group to create all of the talking toys, all of the um, video games. And then we would do the theme park shows and, you know, the Disney on ice experiences. And we would record the talent. We'd write the scripts. We would edit the sound files. And then we would do QC on all of the prototypes that would come in. And so really, I kind of got like a behind the scenes, you know, uh, view in the process and then going then to the stores and seeing those products on shelves. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I had a hand in that, you know, and that was really exciting. Um, and then I ended up in Arizona because my husband proposed and it was more cost effective to live out there. And so um, I was like, God, I'm never going to be in toys again. And then I found Todd. Um, <laughs> By, by way of, a, of, a, uh, of another uh, woman who uh, was, was at a co-ed soccer um, uh, group that I joined. And so I was on a soccer team and, and she said, hey, we're looking for someone in entertainment. You sound like you have you know, a similar background. Why don't you come and, uh, and interview? And so uh, I interviewed, started there and you know, just kind of worked my way through many different departments and you know, did comics and, you know, did entertainment and then segued into the toy side of the business. And I feel like we probably all have moments in our career where you, you get into a position and it just clicks and you're like, this is it, this is it for me. And that was licensing. So licensing became my absolute love and, and it does allow you to touch a lot of different, um, you know, IP and help your group then, you know, create these amazing products. So that's kind of my story on how I moved into, uh, into toys. For sure. And just to go off of that, I, I feel like I had kind of a similar story where I never knew, I never thought that I could have a career in toys. I guess I just never thought that that was a, a career path that I, that was possible for me. I um, went to school for art. But I, just like you, I, I just wanted to be surrounded by creative people. I'm creative myself. And so I went to school for photography. And from there, I started teaching photography. I actually moved out here to Seattle um, and went to grad school for photography and started teaching at the University of Washington. And from there, you know, I realized that teaching just, it, it, it's very interesting, but it wasn't my passion. Um, I've always been obsessed with pop culture and you know, just binge watching TV and movies, comics, everything, like I can't get enough of it. And I just never thought that that is something that I could do as a career. I don't know, I guess I thought it was like a secret club that you had to like have some kind of secret handshake to get into. And, and that wasn't for me, I had to do like what I went to school for, which is never the case. Like that's something that I wish someone would have told me as a kid, like you don't, you probably don't ever end up with what you went to school for, but. Um, from there, I went to business school. So I got an MBA because I was like, I want to go into business and I am really interested in social media and how like art coincides with social. And mm -hmm. so I did that. And I just like spent so much of my life in school, but like working on the side, I worked at these haunted houses and I loved how passionate that fan base is. It's just like, it's, it's, it's like the same thing with toy collectors, right? It's the people that go to these haunts are, are so passionate about going to these and having those experiences every year. So I really fell in love with that fan, that fandom. And from there, I just, you know, I went, I took a trip back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which Daniel's also from, which is amazing. Rep Tulsa. Represent. <laughs> I represent. And I um, went there with my husband and we went to, uh, I wanted to show him this store that I was obsessed with when I was a kid called Vintage Stock which is just like, that's where you go for like used music and, and back in the day VHS tapes and all of that stuff and video games and- uh, we The original went, one on 71st and Mingo? 
So, yep, 71st Domingo. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I I took him to that vendor stock, but then I actually, I, I wanted to show him uh, the Movies 8 Theater. And so we went, <laughs> we went to 71st and uh, we went to that vintage stock and we saw Pop. So uh, Funko Pops there and I had never seen them before. And he walks over and he's holding this like pinhead pop from, <laughs> from the horror movie. And he's like, I have to have this. And I was like, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. I can't believe it's like a horror character, but it's so adorable. And uh, from there, like I still continued to work at the haunted house, but I started looking at other jobs and um, I saw one for Funko and I, I hadn't made the connection that Funko is what made the things that I had collected. Um, and so then I went to the website and I was like, oh, I know what this is. This is fantastic. I would absolutely love to work here. And, uh, you know, I just, I had that interview and they're, they just have such a connection with the fan base there that I, you know, I talked to them about how I really love the fandom behind toy collecting and behind these fandoms and, and how people follow them. And, um, they handed me uh, adorbs of Pinhead at the end of the interview so that I could start my my horror collection. So I just I thought that was such a nice touch. And I've been there since for five for the last five years, which has been really nice. But, um, you know, before that, I had always been really interested in toys and especially Kid Robot. I was a huge fan and I had like High Fructose um, magazine and just all of these art magazines that had those designer toys that I was just so enthralled with. And I think that that really started my interest, but I just, I never ever thought that I could work in that industry. So yeah, never ever think that you have to go with what your education is. <laughs> and on that note, Abby, where, what did you go to school for? Uh, I went to school for journalism and production back in Iowa. So I think we all have a common theme where we're all LA transplants, um, just looking for something a little bit more than I think the Midwest could give us. Um, so when I graduated college, I ran a government access cable station for about four years in Ames, Iowa. And there was budget cuts at the city. And so I got laid off and I thought, LA, that's where all the production's at, right? So I moved to LA, um, totally took an, a leap of faith, just like everyone else. Um, and then I got a job at Electronic Arts in the marketing department. And I started out as an executive assistant, um, but then it, it quickly changed into doing production. So I was doing in-game tutorials, um, B-roll for you know the extras on the DVDs of the game. Um, and I did a little bit work with the licensing teams for like Tolkien while I was at EA as well. Um, then, you know, the Great Recession hit everybody lost their job, <laughs> me included from EA. And then I went back to, you know, kind of my roots in production and I was freelancing as a production coordinator for commercials. And then that led to a job as a managing producer at a small boutique production company. And, you know, it was out here in LA and coincidentally, like our top two clients were Mattel and Spin Master. And we were doing sizzles for, Hot Wheels and, you know, like WWE and Tech Deck and, you know, like just all of the, you know, really big properties for, you know, Mattel and Spin Master. Um, and then I also got laid off from there because of budget cuts. <laughs> uh, and then I ran a couture wedding dress company um, for a while. <laughs> it's, it, this, this, it's just it such a connects. weird, it, it, it really does. And like, <laughs> While I was there, you know, we source all of the dresses for Vietnam. So I had that direct relationship with our, our plant in Vietnam. So, you know, while I was still working there, I knew this wasn't my forever job. So I made a list of like the top three companies I wanted to work for. And it was YouTube, Mattel, and <laughs> the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. <laughs> And I actually like interviewed with the Aquarium of the Pacific when I was like 40 weeks pregnant, but <laughs> for a production job, but they did not hire me, oddly enough. Uh, so I, I kept finding this job like at Mattel, there was like a licensing coordinator position I applied for. I didn't get that. Okay, that's fine. 
then there was a licensing associate, which is a little bit higher than the coordinator. And I interviewed for that. And then I didn't get that. And then they called me, they kept calling me. They called me like two or three more times to come back in for interviews. And finally, you know, like I got a job as the licensing, one of the licensing associates, and I'm now on the Hot Wheels brand. And I love it. And it's just like this perfect combination of like, like I'm a creative type A. So getting, you know, like getting to be surrounded by really like creative folks and it's so inspiring, but like, I don't want to be doing that as a job. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just been such a- You don't a, want to be creative yourself. You just want to be around creatives. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I like to be creative, but not, I think it would be too much pressure to be creative for a job. So anyone that is a designer, I, I give, <laughs> I'm thoroughly impressed and it's, it's amazing. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> You make a really good point though, Abby, is that, you know, people who are creatives by trade, like that have to have deadlines, that's a tough thing, right? To yeah, be on yeah. the spot. Like to be asked to, to come up with the next great thing in two days or a week. Like even when I was working in comics, that's a grind. Monthly mm -hmm. comic book, you're doing a page a day every single day of your life to maintain a schedule right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. And, and what if yeah. you don't come up with creative energy one day? What if you don't think of, of how you can lay out a page or what if you can't deliver a product design in, in a timely fashion? I mean, it is, it's a lot of pressure. For sure. Yeah. I did editing for a long time and it's, you know, like, you know, when you have a client, it kind of takes the joy out of creating that story that you want to. And it's like, okay, well they want this. So that's what we got to go with, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, ah, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> for sure I I have um there are several creatives on my team and I think that that's just a constant struggle that we all have too where it's you know there's the constant grind and there's the deadlines and it's hard to be creative in the moment and especially with a quick turnaround and I think that can be really frustrating for creatives and so it's at least for us it's something we're always still trying to work through and work out but it's like how to create that space for them and to have that kind of those brainstorms that they can have between teams. And if they're able to have projects that are just wholly owned by them that are deadline based so that they can feel like they really put all of their creative effort into it. Cause I think it's, it can be so overwhelming and frustrating to like constantly have those deadlines that they have to meet. Oh, yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, especially like transitioning from Loot Crate. I mean, it was before being in the collectibles business, you know, at General Giant, I was, you know, we had our LTD division, we were trying to branch into mass market, and I was also running a whole OEM division where I was doing like gaming collectors editions, and I was selling in this new revenue stream for our company, but was still managing collectibles, which, you know, we did pre orders when it shipped, it shipped. Um, and now working for a company that's direct to consumer and, you know, you have a small creative team. I mean, my mind is blown when I, when I joined the company, I just had no idea. And we have to pivot. So, so many times because, you know, you have four to five items in a crate, you know, we're doing over 26 crates. They're bi-monthly, monthly, you've got four, you know, figure all, you've got house goods, you've got all kinds of plush. And anything could happen. They're all getting manufactured and they all have to marry up and they have to ship out every single month. And to hit those beats and just, we sit there, we brainstorm, we create, we submit, we make. I mean, it's just, it is crazy. And so seeing the creative team be able to churn it out, but also, you know, I have to be creative, but I also have to be business-minded. So I have to worry about margin. I have to worry about, uh, you know, is this going to, are fans going to really gravitate towards this? Does this make a nice collection or unboxing experience? Um, and, you know, obviously the bottom line is important and can we get it done in time? So, um, you know, but having those longer lead items, you know, like what Hillary was saying, you know, being able to give some creative projects to your team where they have a little bit longer time, um, you know, is, I think, I think that's what helps make you a good manager is when you can see that um, and feed feed your creative team a little bit, you know, because so it's it's the grind, but you still want to give them some pleasure and joy and work on projects that they really like. For sure. 
I always say, uh, get weird with it. That's great. Hillary, that literally came up on a licensing call the other day. Amazing. And we're happy to do it at Super 7. You've all seen what we do. For sure. I'm going to say that that's an upcoming theme in one of our crates, get weird. So stand by. Perfect. I love it. Yeah, it's funny, you know, just to, from what I know of all you ladies, I mean, it, it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, you've all been, you know, in, in these sort of kind of trailblazing positions, you know, I mean, like, you know, like Gentle Giant, uh, well, you know, I mean, first Kid Robot is that, that first kind of retail store that opened, DC Direct was, you know, one of the first uh, collectibles companies that was attached to a, a comic book uh, company. Uh, you, you know, Hillary, what you're doing in uh, fan relations uh, at Funko. I mean, that that as someone that has done that for a collectibles company, you guys are the benchmark. You know, everyone else is is chasing what you guys do. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> you know, Jen. You know, McFarlane. I mean, that he changed the industry that guy i mean he really did and and to be around to be a part of that and to you know i i've known todd for a lot of years and to just kind of watch how he continues to innovate how he continues to think how he i, I mean i feel like he's changed as a man uh just in the time that i've known him uh you know the the industry has uh i think kind of humbled him a bit too but and then you know, when you think about like Super 7, you know, they were a t-shirt and vinyl company for so long. And now when you look at the, the gigantic expanse of what they do uh, is, is just bonkers, you know, and Abby, you know, from taking uh, with, I know what Abby somewhat does uh, as far as Hot Wheels, you know, it's not just the traditional car. She's working with like character cars, but because she knows all of this pop culture stuff and uh, you know, from hanging out with me when we were dating originally too, she knew all these people in the industry. So she was hired on to be in wheels, but she's, you know, she's done stuff for Barbie. She's done stuff for the games team. She's done plush. She's done action figures. You know, it's just like, they're just like, Oh yeah. That's, that's that lady. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think it's, it's I was going to say, Daniel, I think it's really interesting, too, that all of us, you know, we've got to dabble, like, you know, in so many different IPs. And I think for me, at least, that's what's kept me energized is that. Mm -hmm. And also, even though I work for small and big companies, even at the bigger companies, being able to make decisions quickly and, you know, make the product that we want to make without, you know, too much grind, uh, you know, is has always been really great. But it's just the amount of IP that we can just shuffle through. I mean, a lot of people get, I think get stuck working on one IP, you know, and then they don't get to touch anything else. But, you know, I, I love that I've gotten to work on, I think almost any IP that's out there. <laughs> I think it's, it's come through my hands. Yeah, that's the same with us. We actually did a uh, kind of just got some data points about the light, amount of licenses we have on the vehicles team. And between the, the four of us on the vehicles team for licensing, we have 300 unique licenses. So it's, the, you know, like entertainment, the OEMs, you know, the third party race teams, you know, like it's, it's a lot, but it's like to Ashley's point, like just having that variety, I think it's just, it really keeps me going too. Cause it's, it's exciting. It's like, oh, a new mix is coming. It's like, oh, this is a Marvel mix. Awesome. You know, like this is the Mercedes racing mix. Like, you know, it's like I get to touch so many different properties and I really, really like that. What I find at Super 7 that's so interesting is that while we're touching so many different IPs and we have our standard formats, we also are given a lot of creative license to explore and create new formats or find different products that might fit with each license, right? So while yes, we will put out a reaction figure and yes, we'll put out an ultimate, um, you know, or uh, like one of our newer formats, a super, a super cyborg or a super size vinyl, um, there'll be times where the team will just come up with a, a crazy concept that I would have never seen coming. And I'll look at the concept and I'm like, yes, I would buy that. And yes, we need to pitch that because it's just, 
it's and and the other piece of it too is that it's 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 initiated by like passion too like you get so inspired by something and then it just flourishes like those those creative ideas and that's been incredible to be around because I've only been at super seven for what I think this is my fourth month so I'm <laughs> definitely the new kid even though I've been in the industry for quite some time so you know I, I'm seeing things with a fresh set of eyes and it's just it's really amazing to watch all of these passionate creative innovative people just build such amazing worlds and products and and be that extension of fandom. For sure. Yeah. And and to what you said, Jen, uh, Funko is really similar in that, where we have so many licenses and we have our same form factor across. We have a few different form factors, but our licensors allow us so much freedom to just, you know, try different things with their with their IP. And it's really interesting to, to see what the artists come up with. And there are so many different fans within Funko too, where it's, there's just like this really great uh, camaraderie between teammates where it's like, hey, I don't know a lot about anime, but you do. What do you think would be best for this? And then people, a lot of the artists work on projects they're passionate about or that they're fans of. So I think that that really adds to it too. And how um, internally we, we pitch back to the licensors too, like, can we make um, these characters, we're seeing that people online really want these characters made, or the artists are saying like, I watched the show and this character would be really great to design. So it's, it's been really great to see just like that relationship with the licensors. I think that's been what's really unique about Funko too. It's just, it's, it, it, what everyone has said, it's like, it, it is something different every day. And it's really hard to get bored when there are so many different uh, types of fandoms that you're working with. Um, and, you know, some licensors are way more willing to let you get weird with it and others aren't. And so it's not always working with the same people every time. It's like, it's a lot of like people skills too, because you have to be able to navigate totally. people who are very conservative or people who are just like ready for anything. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Including that's, that's... licensors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, did, what did you say, Ashley? I missed that. Including licensors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, as as you guys were talking, it sort of occurs to me, you know, I, I think some people kind of get hung up on their dream, you know, they're just like, oh, I just, I want to work on Star Wars someday, like, and they don't see sort of that bigger picture. And, you know, when you start getting into some of these other licenses and stuff, like there's, there's some just some real joy out there. And, and when you come across uh, a, another company that's, that's excited about their own their own product too uh that can be super fun to work with and and again it's just you know for me as a you know as a collector uh you know when you see these companies continuing to innovate you know like super seven when they do like you know those uh like creature from the black lagoon uh, like halloween bucket or something you go how has that yes. never been made you i know. know i said the same thing to myself when i saw that i was like i I love this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's just uh, you know just watching these sort of uh, innovations, and again, I think it, part of that is a product of you know the people that sort of grew up, and it's like, well, I always wanted something from you know for me, like I always want something from Little Shop of Horrors. I've loved that movie. Funko gave me Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> product, you know, uh, you know, Loot Crate. I think a lot of people went crazy for like. Uh, you know, when they did like the Thanos uh, uh, oven mitt or, you know, things like that. It's just like those things that you, you didn't know you wanted, but you're so glad they exist. And uh, have you guys, I mean, are there any sort of personal favorites for you guys just in your career of things that you have worked on that you kind of went, oh yeah, that's something that I knew once I worked on that would be in my collection. Oh, geez. I feel like, I, well, I feel like between the group here, we've probably worked on so much product that it's really hard to pick just one. Um, I, I, you know, for, for me, God, and this is crazy. Like I, I love the product that, that I make, but I personally don't collect. Like I love, I love getting things for my daughter. So my daughter, by the way, is six. She will eventually become a collector of something. I just don't know what that is yet. I keep putting things in front of her, seeing <laughs> what will like marinate and like stick. 
but we're not there yet. And that's fine. But she loves what mommy does. Right. Like, um, but yeah, but I mean, I like the pieces that we do and I'm happy to watch everybody else collect them, you know, and, and, and see how much people get excited, um, around those pieces. I'm really proud of the work that I've done over the years, um, at McFarlane. And then now at super seven, we're creating amazing things. Um, but I, I don't know that I can pinpoint just one. I've got favorite licenses, but I can't pinpoint just one. I don't know if anybody else has, has ones that they're really proud of. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Cause I have like this whole collection behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, I, you know, we, we launched this retro toys line last year and I am, I've been so excited about it. And it's just, it's so meta that we're making Funko figures of toys, like My Little Pony original retro figures and Barbie and I have Candyland behind me. It's like, uh, like it, I, I just think that's so cool. Or Clue, the board game. Um, so I think that those are the ones that I've been really excited about because that's what I grew up with. Um, a lot of those retro toys that, you know, I collected as a kid. I have Care Bears behind mm -hmm. me with my original Care Bears that I collected as a kid. So like that, um, I think that that was really huge for me to, to have that nostalgia factor, which I think is a reason why a lot of people collect, just collecting their, their childhood and their happy memories. And um, I always like to equate it to like, when I think about why, um, why I collect figures or why I collect Funko, I, I think of it as I used to have on my shelves all of these books and all of these CDs and all of these DVDs. And when people came over, they were like, oh, this is like the kind of things that you're interested in. But now that we've gone digital and, you know, I have all my music on my phone and my books on my phone, basically everything's on my phone. I don't have that thing to show people like these are the shows that I really like. And so that's that's what I, where I think Funko and a lot of these other toy companies come in. It's like, well, now you have these figures that represent the things that you love. Yeah, I mean, I would say, and I think Daniel knows what I'm gonna say, is probably the, the Star Wars Jumbo line that we launched uh, at Gentle Giant almost, gosh, 11, 12 years ago. Um, it was, I, we were really one of the first companies that were looking back at the retro toys. And um, at the time, he's my husband now, we, he was our director of licensing and we were trying to figure out, you know, some new toy lines. And it was really hard with it, Star Wars, especially, um, we we're a collectibles company to really break in and do anything that's plastic. Um, because of the master, you know, toy licensee holders. And so we were, we really wanted to think outside the box and we realized that we wanted to recreate that feeling um, for when the Star Wars figures originally came out, what that would feel like as an adult. And so in doing so, um, we made them at 12 inches and we replicated them exactly. And so since we had, you know, we were the first toy company to use the digital scanning, um, you know, to make consumer products, um, we really leaned in on that technology. And sadly enough, I mean, we were going on eBay, collecting original figures, getting them, just pulling them apart, you know, oh, destroying no. the so we wanted to replicate them exactly. And it was, you know, it's really funny. I mean, I think we did, gosh, I don't even know the total number, but it was definitely over like 70, 72 figures. Um, when we were sending the tooling masters to our factories, you know, back in the day, these were hand sculpted. So there were a lot of imperfections, which makes, which is what makes them so beautiful and wonderful. And, but they were, they were cleaning up the part lines on it and they were making, they were perfecting it to make this perfectly <laughs> symmetrical thing. And we had to go back and say, no, no, it's supposed to look this way, you know? Um, so that line has been, I think to me has been so fun because we branched out, we tried to do it with some other uh, toy lines like animated Batman and whatnot, but in superpowers, but going to conventions and having exclusives and the fans that would, were going nuts. I mean, I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced it. They're yelling at you and lie like it's not fair when you sell out. But uh, in, I've stood in every like, one of your lines at conventions, <laughs> waited on my exclusives. <laughs> but you stand there and these people come up to you and they said, you know, I got this on Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they have some of this, this story to tell you from their childhood and they they just have to have it because it brings back those those memories. And so 
I think that's probably one of my proudest lines um, that I've worked on. I launched because I feel like it, all of a sudden it unrolled all these, a lot of other toy companies started making retro, you know, toys. Um, I mean, we did a big alien figure kind of playing off the same kind of thing where we're making it a jumbo size. And uh, again, for me, it's getting to see people really enjoy that. Of course, collecting those is kind of crazy. Um, so <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, I have them all. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Like, I shouldn't say that I don't collect because my garage is my collection. Like everything's in boxes in the garage. So it's like, it's not in the house. But, but I will say going backwards, I have a lot of my old toys. I don't know if anybody else does that I played with as a kid. So like oh, yeah. talking about old school, my little ponies, my daughter has all of those now. Yep. The, the old school, like, like, do anybody remember the transformers that were, were they die cast or they were metal? Like, yeah, they were absolutely die cast. When they started. I have, yeah. I have all, all of those. I played with my, my Kenner star Wars figures. My brother and I literally killed those things. <laughs> and then something that's actually a little bit full circle at super seven is I used to have the Pee Wee's playhouse figures and that, oh, that nice. carrying case. Does anybody remember that carrying case? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, oh, fun. And you know, at super seven, we're, were doing those those figures so that was super exciting to see that they had picked up that license um but anyways i mean there that, that there's 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 my childhood my youth <laughs> in my garage <laughs> you're mint in <laughs> box <laughs> everything's mint <laughs> did, did any of you feel like when you worked on stuff that you needed to collect you needed to have one of everything that you worked on because I know when I started at DC Direct, like, and even at Kid Robot, like with Bear Bricks, and it was like Series 1 back then, and I felt like I needed to collect one of everything, or the action figures, I would get full case assortments, and then I would ship them back to my dad's in Ohio, and he has them in his garage, because I didn't have room in my apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I, you know, I have every single issue of Spawn that I worked on. Um, and so I, I think I ran spawn 185 through 244 was my run as editor. So, I mean, that's a lot of comic books, but oh, I have yeah. every single issue of that. I have every single variant on those books and it is fun actually, uh, to go back to my very first issue. Cause my very first issue, it was the spawn 185 where Todd came back onto the book and it was the end game run. And on that, Wills Portacio was the artist. And, and we decided to do these like random chase variants that we didn't tell anybody about. And Wills's black and white cover from that book, I think is one of the most sought after covers um, in the comic book market. I, Cause we only printed like 400 of them. Wow. How many of those in your garage do you have? <laughs> 499. <laughs> horrible story. So at McFarland, I move spaces within our building several times, like on our floor. Um, so I went from being in like a double wide cubicle in front of Todd's office when I was doing comics to the other side of the office into my own office eventually when I went into licensing, but I had all these boxes and I was like, God, I, I can't fit all this stuff everywhere. So I put it into a cube of one of my coworkers and I'm like, I'll get that another time. Like I'll whatever, but that's where a bunch of my comics were like the ones that I didn't take home. Like they were part archive, like part my own. And I had five issues of that 185, um, <laughs> And here's what happened, guys. So one day, PR went to go look for um, additional comics to give away at a convention to fans. Oh, oh no. I and don't they like found where this that is box. Going. They found that box and they're like, oh, let's, oh. Just, let's just bring this. Oh. They took the box, guys. And there's so many black and white variants in that box. And Todd, they were giving them away for free. And Todd's signing these books. He's like, wait, where are these books coming from? Why are we giving these? Handing them out. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm, so my yeah, part of my collection went to the fans, which I'm more than happy to provide them with. So you're welcome, fans. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh. So uh, that, that's that's crazy, a a Abby. You didn't talk about what you collect. What what do you collect? And uh, what what were what were some of your childhood toys? Well, I collect Admiral Akbar. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. I have a shelf just for Admiral Akbar, um, and I love I love him so much. <laughs> um, let's see, what did I play with as a kid? Um, you know, I had Cabbage Patch and Barbie. Um, I played with my brother's Masters of the Universe, and the chest crack Skeletor was my favorite. 
Um, I played with Transformers with him. Um, yeah, those are in My Little Pony too. Like that was that was also really big. And Rainbow Bright, which I I still have my Rainbow Bright set. Um, so yeah, but and my daughter plays with it now and the ponies. So it's it it's really crazy to see this like full circle come back. And you know, Daniel I's daughter is a, a super fan <laughs> of like pop culture, which is it blows my mind. So <laughs> But not unsurprising though, right? Given the parents. No, it's not unsurprising <laughs> at all. Yeah. She, 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 uh, every day when she comes home from school, she demands we play Green Lantern and Star Sapphire. It's just like, yeah. how, how many kids know Star Sapphire? <laughs> and like, hey, nobody knows, no kid knows that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really strange. So we have to play the entire Green Lantern Corps uh, after school. So. <laughs> Well, do you let her pick all the figures? Because when I was younger, my brother would let me play with his Kenner Star Wars, but he would only let me play with Princess Leia and Bib Fortuna. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, yeah. Got... That, so creepy. And if I played with it, because I mean, at least they were, you know, hanging out with me. <laughs> no, she absolutely gets free reign of whoever she wants to be. That's that's absolutely fine. So Nice. <laughs> yeah. So uh, kind of what, uh, I mean, what are you guys seeing, right? I mean, I know we're in, we're in just kind of a, a totally bizarre time to be making toys. Uh, you know, I was like kind of asking about like what trends you've seen and what sort of differences. I mean, what, you know, some of us are at home, you know, working with kids around and just, I mean, ha what, what happens going forward when, when we finally go back to normal? How does this all, what, what changes, what stays the same, I guess, do you guys think? I mean, I, I hope this like resurgence of, of intense fandom continues, right? Because I think that, that when the pandemic kind of first started, I think a lot of us probably saw that people turned to their hobbies for escapism, right? Absolutely. They, they wanted to feel comfort on some level and, and toys brought that, right? Collectibles brought that, um, um, board games, you know, things that we used to play with as kids, they, like, that, that all came back. I'd like to hope that that continues in the future, um, but who knows? Um, I know for me, coming from where I came from with McFarlane, I used to always need to be looking at what games were trending, what licenses were trending. Um, we don't have that necessarily at Super 7. At Super 7, we're really just looking for inspiration, what's gonna inspire us. And, and we make it because we wanna make it because it's what we wanna make, right? And we, mm -hmm. we figure that the fans are out there too. But, but as far as um, uh, what's next, I don't know. And I kind of like it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, I feel like for Funko, it's, um, it's a little bit of both where we're always looking for the trends, but we're at the same time looking at the retro licenses that we can make. And because it's kind of that mix of nostalgia and also like what's coming out and um, what people are interested in, like WandaVision and, and some of the, the new content that's been flighting since we've been in the pandemic. But I think a huge shift for us, especially on the fan marketing side, is the in-person events. I mean, that is like, that. that's kind of Funko's thing. Like we just, we love going to all of the conventions or a, a lot of the conventions that we can and meeting the fans in person. And, um, you know, we have the whole sentiment of Funko family where um, we really feel like the fan base are part of the family. They, ha they help us make the products. We listen to the feedback and it is a huge part of why we do what we do. And not having that has been a huge shift. We, with the, when the um, quarantine started last year, which is crazy to think, um, we had to really quickly shift for Emerald City Comic Con and we made our first Funko Virtual Con and we've done so many since we we're in the middle of um, Emerald City Virtual Con right now. Um, so it's it's been really bizarre having everything be online and we're still trying to have that same, you know, fan engagement, but it's not a, it's not 100 percent present the same and I think we just cannot wait to be back in person and go to the cons pick up the weird apparel and buy the weird things when you get con brain which I don't know if you guys get con brain but I sure do and when I do I end up buying the weirdest stuff <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, it's uh, it's sort of interesting because you know for not having you know we didn't have Comic Con last year, we didn't have Toy Fair proper this year, so you know for collectors it kind of feels a little bit like when we were kids when you didn't know it was coming out till you like flipped the card over or like opened up the the Sears Wish Book or something like that. You know we we've kind of got this year of surprises ahead of us, which is kind of kind of fun and exciting. For sure. And it, it's kind of weird, too, because I feel like people, at least at cons, they want to know what the most popular item is. And people have to kind of decide on their own what the most popular item is and what they really want, because they can't see it physically leaving the shelves on the in the booth. They can't see what exactly what's low and, and what's still left. So that's kind of been interesting to see, too, like what people are gravitating towards or if because like sometimes we would see at conventions, one item would sell out immediately one day and then the next day it wouldn't. So it, yeah. is it, I think it's just like people feed off of each other and they're like, that, that one's getting low. I have to get it. <laughs> and so that behavior is totally different now. So, you know, one thing I uh... Uh, one thing I didn't kind of want to do with this panel, you know, to, to me, you're just women that happen to work in toys. It's not like, you know, there's something intrinsic about, you know, men or, or women in the field, although it has, you know, like a lot of fields been dominated by by men before. But one thing you hear kind of over and over in the toy industry for a long time was girls don't sell, you know, female figures don't sell. Uh, but I feel like now we're with kind of I don't know the the chains and changes in entertainment and things that we're saying that that sort of thing is more popular I mean would you guys say that you're you're noticing a shift in that like everyone loved watching WandaVision I think people's like yeah I want to Wanda or something like that you know I, I I know you know watching Captain Marvel with my wife and my my daughter were just like this is great this how, how have we waited 70 years for a Wonder Woman movie like what, what do you guys notice just sort of industry-wise being women what kind of uh, changes and shifts well I think a lot of it is coming from I think Marvel's really leading the charge on being they're being very very proactive about showing strong, powerful women. And in turn, I think that trickles down to the toys too. Like I know for, you know, for Hot Wheels and our character cars, you know, even our premium lines, we are making sure we have female representation in almost every mix. Um, and, you know, that's also coming from Marvel too. And it's like, that's one of their, you know, like they want, to make sure their licensees are putting female characters into their mixes. And I think they've really started this amazing trend of, and I hope it continues, I think it will, um, but just like women can be powerful, entertaining, smart, you know, and it's like, it's so refreshing to see that because all of us here on the panel, we already know that, <laughs> but to actually see it and to have you know, like male, male fans see it as well. I think that really, really is helping. From, from my perspective, you know, with, with female action figures, I think that the thing that's important here, and, you know, I've seen a lot of studies on this is that maybe that's not always the medium that, that women will collect, right? Mm. Women tend to collect a lot more, you know, to, to Hillary's Taylor's job over here, uh, Funko figures. I mean, that's, that's something that a lot of women are, are drawn to, but, but I agree with Abby, like showcasing strong characters in general is what should sell the figures, right? Not necessarily their gender. Um, mm -hmm. but I think, I think that we're going to, we're going to see, um, a space in which we're now seeing a lot more representation across many lines of product. And that's, that's a really exciting thing for me moving forward. Um, with a lot of the companies because I see people making changes. Definitely. Yeah. And, yeah, and I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think too, with that, with the studios and really focusing on some of their females and, you know, the way that they're designing them, the way that their costumes are designed, obviously that translates to consumer products. And then giving that, you know, a lot of them already have these amazing origin stories. And, you know, until, you know, really now, I mean, you know, you have the Scarlet Witch, you know, you have Wanda Vision, which, you know, 
starting out the series, it's like, if you didn't know who this was, like, how do you know? But if you, you know, the more you watch it, you find out this is an incredible story behind this character who's, you know, has gone through so much, but, you know, yields all this power. And, um, you know, of course you have Wonder Woman, you know, with those, that movie series. Um, so I think it's, again, I think it's the storytelling, their origin stories, it's giving them a lot of depth, which I don't think you really saw before. It was kind of just the girl with the guys, you know, fighting, you know, crime or whatever. Um, so I think a lot of that is really important um, as it translates into consumer products. And I think from our job as a, you know, a licensee is looking at that and uh, translating that into a consumer product, whether it's a stylized figure, um, you know, and obviously I think one of the biggest challenges is how to, as a company, set yourself apart from what everyone else is doing, but still do something that's really uh, fun for the collectors and fans. It's engaging, but it still holds true to that character and their origin, you know. Exactly. And I was just going to um, parrot that too, where it's uh, a lot of what we create is, is mimicking that content that's coming out. So because we have seen that shift with more um, female-centered uh, movies and TV shows coming out, um, our product lines are following that trend too. And I think that there has been a misconception for a really long time, even with Funko, who, which like maybe looks to be more um, female focused. Um, even with, with our product lines, I think there was a misconception that boys or men were more likely to collect. When we actually dove into who's buying Funko and who's following Funko on social media, we found that it was like a really close 50-50 split between men and women. And so we were just like, okay, well, how, um, how, do, we, uh, how do we make sure that male fans and female fans um, are getting the kinds of collections that they're looking for. So I think that, yeah, the, the content that's coming out has really taken that turn and we've seen such success in it too. So I think that it just opens it up. And I, I, I've also seen that like, it's no longer, you know, like a girl's aisle and a boy's aisle, like in, in the stores and retail too. It's just, it's more of like, these are toys and they're for kids. And, and so it's really exciting to see that where there are things that are a lot less gendered now. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I say, you know, I talk about like Wonder Woman and, you know, uh, Captain Marvel and, and WandaVision stuff, but who, who would have thought we would have so many form factors of the Golden Girls to choose from at this point? Like, that's, uh, no one would have ever expected that. And it's, and it's fantastic. Golden Girls mug. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, and now we need a Golden Girls skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was so amazing, I'm telling you. <laughs> but yeah, just I mean, even going back and and you know, again, I think it's important to to you know to reach back even to those those kind of properties too, and say these were great characters also and beloved, and and we're certainly seeing that because you know a lot of people grabbed that license and a lot of people did really well with it, you know, so. That uh, I, I think that's terrific. I, I love seeing that. Absolutely, uh, we're getting we're getting close to uh, the the time that they have have asked us to wrap up here. But uh, I want to just talk a little bit. Ask you guys any advice that you would have for uh, other women that might be looking to get into this field. You know, you know uh, lessons learned, advice, what, whatever you've got for them. I can kick it off. Um, I sure. guess I, I would say that I. I found that, um, like I said before, what you went to school for doesn't mean that that's your end all career. And if there's something you're really passionate about, um, whether it's a fandom or um, if you're artistic, um, that's, that's something that you can find an industry for and really love what you do. And you shouldn't be shy about applying. I think one thing, um, I know a lot of people, you know, who have been trying to find jobs uh, during the pandemic and everything. And I, I, one thing I hear from women especially is, I'm not qualified for that, so I'm not gonna apply for it. 
And that's like, even if you don't fit every single check mark on that list, you should apply for it because you never know what the hiring manager is really looking for. Maybe they put that on the list and it wasn't as important as something else that you absolutely ex excel at. So I think that you should always take that leap, apply for something that you want to do and that you, even if you don't think that you have a hundred percent of the qualifications. And if you love toys, look for jobs at toy companies because I had no idea that I could work at one. <laughs> Great advice. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay. I, uh, I was going to say, um, for me, um, I think the best advice that I can get of anyone coming into this field or these kinds of fields um, is to really like sit down and learn it all and start from the bottom and learn every division you possibly can and how everything informs one another, you know, because it isn't just one thing it's a process and everybody's parts make the greater, the greater whole of the product, but, but we need each other in order to make what goes out there. Right. And, and to make what goes out there be um, authentic. Um, and that's another thing that I, that I would encourage people to do just in general in any industry is for me, authenticity and transparency are key. And I have found that it is, is really, um, uh, it's, it's been the best thing that I, I, I could have stuck to in my career because I truthfully believe that I am where I am today because I've stuck to those two main points. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> I was lagging. <laughs> um, I think, you know, just going back, um, you know, I think for most of my career, you know, like to your point earlier, Daniel, I've worked mostly around men. I, I really rarely found any women that were actually doing hands-on product development um, and working with factories. Um, you know, you had buyers and people sourcing, but actually being hands-on and that, that development process, um, you know, so I think don't be intimidated. Um, you know, if you're passionate about it, you know, it, your, your true colors will fly and you'll flourish. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate now I work at a company, I think it's mostly women and it's absolutely amazing. And it's super exciting for me um, to work with such intelligent, smart, authentic women that support each other. Um, I had never been in that kind of environment before. So um, if you're not in it now, it may happen one day. <laughs> um, it's just finding that path. And the second part um, I touched upon earlier was, um, you know, if you can't get your foot in the door right away, um, no matter where you are, whether you're traveling, whether you're, you know, uh, you take a retail job, you're waiting tables, uh, network with people because you just never know who you're going to meet um, and, you know, be authentic. And you just never know when they're going to say, you know what, I, it doesn't matter. You don't have the experience. I love your energy. I love what you, you know, you're, you're passionate about something and, you know, you may, you may just get a job that way. I, I absolutely agree, Ashley. Like that's kind of been my path too. It's just like, it's like, you never know who you're going to meet and who you're going to run into. And that's, you know, part of the reason I'm at Mattel is because of that. And the other thing I would, I would say is just be persistent too. And, you know, like if I wouldn't have applied at Mattel like two times, I wouldn't have got the job, you know, like, and they, they saw, you know, that I was very interested in being a part of being a part of the company and they, they found a position for me. And so, but if I would have just given up, I wouldn't be working at Mattel right now. So I think that's important to remember. That, that's great. Yeah. Well, ladies, thank you so, so much uh, for this. This was such a great conversation. These things are always too short. Again, I would talk to you guys for another seven hours if they would let me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, all the ex opinions expressed here are just of these people. They're not necessarily of their companies or anything, but uh, there's been so much great insight, advice, experience, passion, joy, and love uh, just shown here that uh, it just, 
you know, again, it's why I, I do this. It's why I collect. I just, I love it. I love talking to people that do it. And I, I thank you guys so much for sharing your, your knowledge and your experience and your passions, uh, not just here, but, you know, in the products that you make. It's so wonderful uh, to walk into a store or see something new pop up online uh that just goes that's that's what i've been waiting for you know and uh your guys i know you, there's there's no perfect job you know every there's blood sweat and tears behind all of this too but uh you know being able to keep your your joy and your your passion uh really shines through so uh, I, I thank you guys so much let's uh just real quick uh again we'll go in alphabetical order tell people if they want to find your product, uh, if there's a good, you know, URL or Instagram or whatever, where they can look. So we'll start with you, Abby. Uh, it's, you can find it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty true. Um, we're also doing like a, a Mattel creations on Instagram. We're doing some really, really cool, unique, um, unique product that's only available there. Um, but like with Hot Wheels, it's available everywhere in every store. Barbie, same thing. And there's also the Mattel shop. I think it's mattelshop.com or shopmattel.com. But but yeah, Excellent. it's there. Yes, Ashley. Uh, you can go to lootcrate.com. We have a lot of new crates all the time. We just launched our TMNT crate uh, with the NECA figures. And of course there's NECA. You can go to any Walmart or a Target store and we have a designated area where we have lots of amazing product uh, that our team is working on. Excellent. All right, Hillary. Yeah, you can go to funko.com. That's F-U-N-K-O. And then all of our social is original Funko. And then for Super 7 products, you can go to super7.com. And we are also located in many independent retailers, specialty retailers across the country. And then we do, we do. Have, yes, star. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we do also have uh, products that are now uh, coming into uh, the Target uh, license shop. And if you find yourself in San Francisco or San Diego, yeah, stop in at the Super 7 <laughs> retail stores. Yeah, I don't give the retail stores a, uh, a I guess that's true for Funko too. Oh, that's true. Yeah, Funko. Yeah. You've got, yeah, I've been to, I've been to both of your stores also. So there's a Mattel store in El Segundo. That's right. I've been to yeah. that too. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much, ladies, for being part of uh, WonderCon at home. I look forward to seeing you all in person again, except for Abby, who I'll, when I walk out of here, I'll see also. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for agreeing to this and, you know, keep, keep your, y'all doing the Lord's work. Just keep on doing what you're doing uh, as, as, you know, a representative of, of fandom. I really do appreciate all you guys do for, uh, making awesome stuff thank you thank you so much you bet. and thank you everyone uh for wondercon at home for watching uh and you know if you have any questions you can reach out to me uh at actionfigureinsider.com uh or you know at action figure insider on instagram and stuff like that if you have questions for these people ask me i'll see if i can pass along and get you an answer but uh everyone stay safe and uh, just, uh, you know, wear your masks. We're going to get through this. We're going to see each other again. And uh, I can't wait for that. So buy some toys, find some joy, and we'll all talk soon. Certainly. Bye.